Vanakkam, Krishna Mackenzie, The One Straw Revolution, Chapter 3, Returning to the Country. On the day following this experience, May 16th, I reported to work and handed in my resignation on the spot. My superiors and friends were amazed. They had no idea what to make of this. They held a farewell party for me in a restaurant above the wharf but the atmosphere was a bit peculiar. This young man, who had, until the previous day, gotten along well with everyone, who did not seem particularly dissatisfied with his work, who on the contrary had wholeheartedly dedicated himself to his research, had suddenly announced that he was quitting. And there I was, laughing happily. At that time, I addressed as everyone as follows. On this side is the wharf. On the other side is Pier 4. If you think there is life on this side, then death is on the other. If you want to get rid of the idea of death, then you should rid yourself of the notion that there is life on this side. Life and death are one. When I said this, everyone became even more concerned about me. What's he saying? He must be out of his mind, they must have thought. They all saw me off with rueful faces. I was the only one who walked out briskly in high spirits. At that time, my roommate was extremely worried about me and suggested that I take a quiet rest, perhaps out on the Boso Peninsula. So I left. I would have gone anywhere at all if someone had asked me. I boarded the bus and rode for many miles, gazing out at the checkered pattern of fields and small villages along the highway. At one stop, I saw a small sign which read, Utopia. I got off the bus there and set out in search of it. On the coast, there was a small inn, and climbing the cliff, I found a place with a truly wonderful view. I stayed at the inn and spent the days dozing in the tall grasses overlooking the sea. It may have been a few days, a week or a month, but anyway, I stayed there for some time. As the days passed, my exhilaration dimmed and I began to reflect on just what had happened. You could say, I was finally coming to myself again. I went to Tokyo and stayed for a while, passing the, de passing the days by walking in the park, stopping people on the street and talking to them, sleeping here and there. My friend was worried and came to see how I was getting along. Aren't you living in some dream world? Some world of illusion, he asked. <coughs> no, I replied. It is you who are living in the dream world. <coughs> we both thought. I am right and you are in the dream world. When my friend turned to say goodbye, I answered with something like, don't say goodbye. To part is just to part. My friend seemed to have given up hope. I left Tokyo, passed through the Kansai area, and came as far south as Kyushu. I was enjoying myself, drifting from place to place with the breeze. I challenged a lot of people with my conviction that everything is meaningless and of no value, and that everything returns to nothingness. But... This was too much, or too little, for the everyday world to conceive. There was no communication whatsoever. I could only think of this concept of non-usefulness as being of great benefit to the world, and particularly the present world, which is moving so rapidly in the opposite direction. I actually wandered about with the intention of spreading the word throughout the whole country. The outcome was that Wherever I went, I was ignored as an eccentric. <coughs> so I returned to my father's farm in the country. My father was growing tangerines at that time, and I moved into a hut on the mountain and began to live a very simple, primitive life. I thought that if here, as a farmer of citrus and grain, I could actually demonstrate my realization the world would recognize its truth. <coughs> <coughs>
instead of offering a hundred explanations, would not practicing this philosophy be the best way? My method of do-nothing farming began with this thought. It was in the 13th year of the present emperor's reign, 1938. I settled myself on the mountain and everything went well up to the time that my father entrusted me with the richly bearing trees in the orchard. He had already pruned the trees to the shape of sake cups so that the fruit could easily be harvested. When I left them abandoned in this, st in this state, the result was that the branches became intertwined, insects attacked the trees, and the entire orchard withered away in no time. My conviction was that crops grow themselves and should not have to be grown. I had acted in the belief that everything should be left to take its natural course. But I found that if you apply this way of thinking all at once, before long, things do not go so well. This is abandonment, not natural farming. <coughs> My father was shocked. He said, I must re-discipline myself, perhaps take a job somewhere and return when I have pulled myself back together. At that time, my father was headman of the village and it was hard for the other members of the community to relate to his eccentric son, who obviously could not get along with the world, living as he did back in the mountains. Moreover, I disliked the prospect of military service and as the war was becoming more and more violent, I decided to go hum along humbly with my father's wishes and take a job. At that time, technical specialists were few. The Kochi Prefecture testing station heard about me and it came about that I was offered the post of head researcher of disease and insect control. I imposed upon the kindness of Kochi Prefecture for almost eight years. At the testing center, I became a supervisor in the scientific agricultural division and in research devoted myself to increasing wartime food productivity. But actually during those eight years, I was pondering the relationship between scientific and natural agriculture. Chemical agriculture, which utilizes the products of human intelligence was reputed to be superior the question which was always in the back of my mind was whether or not natural agriculture could stand up against modern science. When the war ended, I felt a fresh breeze of freedom and with a sigh of relief, I returned to my home village to take up farming anew. For 30 years, to, excuse me, towards a do-nothing farming, page 15, for 30 years, I lived only in my farming and had little contact with people outside my own community. During those years, I was heading in a straight line towards a do-nothing agricultural method. The usual way to go about developing a method is to ask, how about trying this or how about trying that? Bringing in a variety of techniques, <coughs> one upon the other. This is modern agriculture, and it only results in making the farmer busier. My way was opposite. I was aiming at a pleasant, natural way of farming, which results in making the work easier instead of harder. How about not doing this? How about not doing that? That was my way of thinking. I ultimately reached the conclusion that there was no need to plow, no need to apply fertilizer, no need to make compost, no need to use insecticide. When you get right down to it, there are few agricultural practices that are really necessary. The reason that man's improved techniques seem to be necessary is that the natural balance has been so badly upset beforehand by those same techniques that the land has become dependent on them. This line of reasoning not only applies to agriculture, but to other aspects of human society as well. Doctors and medicine become necessary when people create a sickly environment. Formal schooling has no intrinsic value, but becomes necessary 
when humanity creates a condition in which, in which one must become educated to get along. Before the end of the war, when I went up to the citrus orchard to practice what I then thought was natural farming, I did no pruning and left the orchard to itself. The branches became tangled. And the trees were attacked by insect and almost two acres of mandarin orange trees withered and died. From that time on, the question, what is the natural pattern, was always in my mind. In the process of arriving at the answer, I wiped out another 400 trees. Finally, I felt I could say with certainty, this is the natural pattern. To the extent that trees deviate from their natural form, pruning and insect extermination become necessary. To the extent that human society separates itself from a life close to nature, schooling becomes necessary. In nature, formal schooling has no function. In raising children, many parents make the same mistake I made in the orchard at first. For example, teaching music to children is as unnecessary as pruning orchard trees. A child's ear catches the music, the murmuring of a stream, the sound of frogs croaking by the riverbank, the rustling of leaves in the forest. All these natural sounds are music, true music. But when a variety of disturbing noises enter and confuse the ear, the child's pure, direct appreciation of music degenerates. If left to continue along that path, the child will unable will be unable to hear the call of a bird or the sound of the wind as songs. That is why music education is thought to be beneficial to the child's development. The child who is raised with, a, with an ear pure and clear may not be able to play the popular tunes on the violin or the piano, but I do not think this has anything to do with the ability to hear true music or to sing. It is when the heart is filled with song that the child can be said to be musically gifted. Almost everyone thinks that nature is a good thing, but few can grasp the difference between natural and unnatural. If a single new bud is snipped off a fruit tree with a pair of scissors, that may bring about disorder which cannot be undone. When growing according to the natural form, branches spread alternately from the trunk <coughs> and the leaves receive sunlight uniformly. If the sequence is interrupted, the branches come into conflict, conflict, lie one upon another and become tangled, and the leaves wither in the places where the sun cannot penetrate. Insect damage develops. If the tree is not pruned, the following year, more withered branches will appear. Human beings, with their tampering, do something wrong, leave the damage unrepaired, and when the adverse results accumulate, work with all their might to correct them. When the corrective actions appear to be successful, they come to view these measures as splendid accomplishments. People do this over and over again. It is as if a fool were to stomp on and break the tiles of his roof. Then when it starts to rain and the ceiling begins to rot away, he hastily climbs up to mend the damage, rejoicing in the end that he has accomplished a miraculous solution. It is the same with the scientist. He pours over books night and day, straining his eyes and becoming nearsighted. And if you wonder what on earth he has been doing all that time, it is to become the inventor of eyeglasses to correct nearsightedness. One straw revolution.